Good to be back in Stony Ford with you all. Um, it, it was a great trip. Cindy and I had a, a, a great time. We got to have some time away, got to rest. Uh, we participated in a, a marriage enrichment, and we even got to go to church where we didn't know anyone or have any responsibilities for the first time in at least 10 years. And, and the strangest thing happened. When we were driving there, I started feeling anxious. It was, I mean, I'm thinking of like... I mean, I gained a whole new appreciation for what it must be like to come to church at a new church or for the first time or the, for the first time in a long time. That, that's not an experience I've had for a long time. But as we're driving, I'm going, I don't know what the music's going to be like. I don't know what the order of the service is going to be like. I don't know what the preaching is going to be like. What if I sit in the wrong seat? And I don't want to go. And everybody makes fun of me. And, I'm, and I've, we've been in full-time ministry for 16 years, and I had all the same nerves that you'd feel as if you'd never participated in the life of a church ever. So renewed appreciation for, for what you all do showing up each and every week and um, for overcoming that fear and that maybe sense of anxiety in your own life to be here. So thank you for continuing to do that and for continuing to function as a loving and welcoming church family even in our absence last week. Go ahead and open your Bibles to Matthew 5. This morning we'll finish this second movement in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus is defining what righteousness looks like in His kingdom. Remember, He's first described who He, by grace, transforms us into in the Beatitudes. He said back in verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He says, the kingdom of God belongs to those who recognize that by our sinfulness, we have nothing and can do nothing to secure for ourselves a right standing with God. Apart from Christ, we're debtors to sin and hopelessly lost. In our sin, we're enemies of God, yet... In Christ, God pours out His grace by which He redeems us, and He forgives our sin, and He gives us new hearts, and He transforms those who once hated Him, that's us, into beloved children who inherit His kingdom. Even though that is the clear teaching of all of Scripture, that teaching would have created some tension in the lives of the first hearers. Those there on the hillside near the Sea of Galilee listening to the Sermon on the Mount. You see, they had looked to the scribes and Pharisees as examples of spiritual and moral virtue. And the Pharisees taught a different message. Rather than salvation by grace through faith in the Messiah, the Pharisees taught that our standing with God was earned by obedience to the law of Moses, and that when the Messiah come, comes, He would come to rid them of their enemies, those filthy Romans, oppressing them, making their lives difficult. Jesus pointed out in verse 20, a little bit of a problem with the Pharisees' prescription for righteousness. He said, For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. And then Jesus begins this section that we're concluding today where He pre prescribes a way of living for His people that not only keeps the letter of the law, but exceeds the superficial obedience that the Pharisees taught. This is a section that I'm aiming to finish today. I have this chart, and this will be the last time I'll make you look at it. Understand that Jesus is prescribing a way of living that's truly righteous, but not a way to earn something from God. We know that salvation is by grace alone. 
And He's giving us a way of living that moves us out of the patterns of sin and death so that we can walk in the newness of life that Christ purchased for us. That's what this section is about. From salvation, Jesus prescribes a righteousness that moves us out of the patterns of sin and death that characterize our lives apart from Christ and into the newness of life that He purchased for us. Murder and hatred are part of that same pattern. Reconciliation is the pattern of newness of life. Adultery and lust grow from the same soil. Cutting off temptation is the pattern of new life. It's this repeated theme, these transforming initiatives that don't save us, but they do grow us and shape us and make us more like Christ. And so here, in this concluding message of this section, Jesus demonstrates a love of all things, a love for those who hate us. The one who loved those who hated him to the point of dying for them confronts this teaching of the Pharisees that said it was a spiritual duty to simultaneously love those who love you and hate everyone who's different. Here Jesus wants to move us, His disciples, out of that pattern of sin and death that perpetuates nothing but hatred. Look at verses 43 through 48. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For He makes His Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. So here's the traditional understanding handed down by the Pharisees. Love your friends, hate your enemies. That's it. That's what the Pharisees taught. If you were a first century Jew living in ancient Near East Israel, you would have been expected as a spiritual duty to love your neighbors and hate your enemies. Equally, those things were equal, equally weighted commands. You would have been expected as a, as a, a good Jew, keeping the, te the teaching of the Pharisees, keeping the teaching of the religious leaders of the day, if you want to participate in Jewish community life, it means loving who the community tells you to love and hating who the community tells you to hate. That was righteousness according to the Pharisees. Half of this teaching is biblical. Uh, let me re rephrase that. Half of this quotation is biblical. None of the teaching is biblical, if you look at how they interpreted the first part. But half of this quotation, love your neighbors and hate your enemies, is biblical. Guess which half? No, no. Please say the first half. Right. The love part. Love your neighbor is an Old Testament command. Let's look at it with some context. Leviticus 19, 15 through 18. You shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty. In righteousness you shall judge your neighbor. You shall not go about as a talebearer among your people, nor shall you take a stand against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall surely rebuke your neighbor and not bear sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord." There's a lot of things commanded here. 
do no injustice, show no partiality, judge righteously, don't hate your brother, confront the sin of your neighbor, but do it in love, don't hold grudges, don't take vengeance, love your neighbor as yourself. But there's no command to hate anyone. There's plenty of references in Scripture that tell us to hate sin. There's passages that tell us to hate evil and injustice. There's even prayers recorded in the Bible where people ask God to judge evil and express their own hatred. But there's nothing where we find God telling us to hate anyone. It's nowhere in Scripture, hate your enemy. It's purely an invention, a tradition handed down by the Pharisees. Among the Dead Sea Scrolls, there's copies of many books of the Bible, as well as other writings. One of those other writings that was found there was a scroll called the Community Rule. It was a manual for discipline that governed participation in community life among some of the more legalistic Jews around the time that Jesus walked the earth. Like 100 AD is when they would, 100 BC is when they would date this. So around the time that Jesus is contemporary, the teachings that were found in this cave are also contemporary ideas. The scroll begins by saying that par to participate in community life. In other words, you want to interact, you want to be part of the community, this is how you have to live. It says that the people should be taught to obey Moses, that they love all that God has chosen, in other words, all the people, all of God, love all God's preferred people, and hate all, his, all that he's rejected. Hate everyone else. Well, what does that translate to? Love the Jews and hate everyone who's not. Near the end of the book, the people are commanded, this is a quotation, you can read it for yourself, they're commanded to an everlasting hatred in a spirit, a spirit of secrecy for the men of perdition. And later it goes on to tell the members of the community to leave outsiders enslaved to their sin and the death that it brings. Just retreat from them and watch them die and go to hell and be glad about it. You see, they read this passage from Leviticus that we just read, and I'm going to emphasize a few things in it. They interpreted what was meant as a limit, they interpreted what was a command to love your neighbor as a limitation on who they could love. He says, love your neighbor, and they go, okay, well, then I'll, so, so you're telling me to hate everybody else? God goes, no, love your neighbor. Okay, so hate everyone who's not? No, no, love your neighbor. Got it. I'll hate everyone who doesn't live next door and think just like me. They underlined these words among your people, your brethren, the children of your people, your neighbor. Love those in the community. Love those who are like you. Love those who think like you think and value what you value. Love the good Jews, but hate the backsliders. Love your fellow Israelites, but hate the Gentile pigs who surround you. Hate the filthy Romans who oppress you. That's the standard of righteousness that Jesus calls us to outlive, to live in a way that is surpassing of. If we're honest, loving those who love us and hating people who hate us is sort of ingrained into our fallen human nature. We group people into categories and we associate most positively with those who are most like us. We like people who think like us and live like us and we naturally associate with people with similar interests or work habits or similar appreciation for food or music. We, we gather in stadiums with people who like the same team that we like and we feel connected to everybody that's wearing the same color jersey as us for those two hours that were there. But in certain cities, if you're wearing the wrong color shirt, you might not survive your walk from the stadium to your car are because human nature says love those who are like us and hate the others 
As much as the Pharisees were a religious group, they were a political party. And so perhaps there is no clearer illustration of this in our own culture than in the arena of politics. Now, I will not get on the stump for any political party from this platform ever. I have opinions, I have convictions, and I hope that those things are brought more and more into agreement with Scripture as I continue to learn and grow, and I will vote according to those convictions, but I am a Bible teacher, and I will use this platform for no other purpose. So this is merely an illustration that I've observed that I think illustrates the point. Very similar to, similarly to what was going on in the time that Jesus gives the Sermon on the Mount. I've, I've observed that to participate in public discourse in our culture, you first have to swear blind loyalty and undying allegiance to a political party and its leaders. And if you're blue, hatred for people and ideas that are red is required. And if you're red, it's also expected that you hold equal disdain for people and ideas that are blue. I mean, you can be blue or red as long as you want to stay home and be quiet about it. But if you want to be involved in the conversation, if you want to participate in public discourse, you have to pick a side and you have to hate the other side and it's all or nothing. Cindy and I have experienced this firsthand. I'm sure many of you have as well. Longtime friends, I mean, people that were in our wedding will no longer associate with us because we've voiced support for ideas that are intolerable among the community to which our friends associate with. And rather than merely disagreeing with our perspective and keeping us as friends, they follow through with the demands of their allegiance to a community that requires them to hate us. And as a result of this practice, the world gets angrier, the fires of hatred burn hotter, hostility grows, and Satan applauds. But that same mentality is the so-called righteousness that the Pharisees taught. That's the traditional understanding. Love your friends, hate the others. And it's an ever-darkening pattern, a spiral of sin and death that has led to the worst atrocities in human history. The hatred of an ethnic group because they're different, the enslavement of a people who are different, the genocide of millions upon millions justified in the minds of those who have no trouble loving those who are like them. Understand that. They have no trouble loving those who are like them. They get half the command right. And then they also get right this other half that the Pharisees would have them subscribe to, hate those who are different. And so Jesus exposes this cycle of sin and death in verses 46 and 47. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Here's the true cycle of sin. No heart change is needed to love your friends. It's natural. There's nothing spiritual about it. There's nothing special about it. There's nothing righteous about it. It's normal. Jesus says, even the tax collectors do that. Now, tax collectors in Jesus' day were Jews who were commissioned by the Roman government to collect heavy taxes from their own countrymen, and they were allowed by law to, with the force of the Roman government, extort more from their friends and neighbors to line their own pockets. They could keep whatever they could raise more than Rome demanded of them. And you can't say a word about it. 
And little Zacchaeus comes and he says, I know your business better than the Roman guy. You haven't paid enough. And you're like, come on, Zacchaeus, you're my neighbor. You've known me forever. Like, I paid what I'm supposed to pay. And he goes, no, no, no. You haven't paid what you're supposed to pay. Come on. And you got to pay him. And if you say a word about it, Zacchaeus has two Roman soldiers right there ready to break your kneecaps. Luke 19, 1 through 8. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. And he ran ahead and climbed into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for I must stay at your house. And so he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained saying, He is gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Nobody's glad that Zacchaeus is searching for Jesus. Nobody's glad that Jesus is reaching out to somebody like Zacchaeus, who's the worst of the worst. Everybody's focus is, is can you believe Jesus doesn't hate Zacchaeus? We, he has to hate Zacchaeus, or we're going to hate him too. From the Jewish perspective, tax collectors were the worst of the worst. They hated Zacchaeus because he was ripping them off, and they demanded that Jesus hate him too. They were furious that he would associate with a filthy tax collector. I don't think this illustration is quite as provocative in our thinking as it would have been to the first century Jews. I mean, I don't, I don't, like the, the IRS doesn't exactly give me the warm and fuzzies, but I, I don't hate the IRS. I don't, I don't hate tax collectors. I don't even know any tax collectors. Perhaps this will resonate in our mind a little bit more. If the standard of righteousness is that we're good to those who are like us and we're mean to everyone else who's different, then Nazis are righteous. Right? Nazis were friends with other Nazis. Even Hitler had a wife. Jesus is saying that if the standard of righteousness is simply being good to those who are like you and greeting those who are like you, then even the very worst of the worst meet the standard. Even tax collectors are friendly to other tax collectors. If the standard is love your friends and hate your enemies like the Pharisees taught, then even the oppressive Roman government extorting and enslaving the Jews were good and righteous according to the standard. That's what Jesus points out. I should also say that this command to hate your enemies is nowhere in Scripture. It's not in the Old Testament. It's not in the New Testament. It is flat out contradicted by the Old Testament and here in the New Testament in what Jesus says. But just if they were to just read the scriptures available to them at that time, they would have known hatred toward my enemies is not something that God has prescribed for me. Exodus 23, 4 and 5, Law of Moses, it commands the Hebrew people, kindly assist those who hate them. If you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, you shall surely bring it back to him again. If you see the donkey of one who hates you lying under its burden, and you would refrain from helping it, you shall surely help him with it. Command from God. You see somebody who you know hates your guts, broken down on the side of the road, and your natural inclination is to keep on driving, you stop. You stop and help them. 
Proverbs 24, 17. It prohibits the people of God from rejoicing in the misfortune of our enemies. Do not rejoice when your enemy falls. And do not let your heart be glad when he stumbles. That doesn't sound like I'm allowed to hate him, does it? Job says in Job 31, 29, If I have rejoiced at the destruction of him who hated me, or lifted myself up when evil found him, in, in saying that, he's, the context is Job surveying, enlisting all the circumstances in which a person would be guilty and punishable by God justly. That's listed among them. If I rejoiced at the destruction of him who hated me, I would be guilty and deserving of judgment. Israel was supposed to be a light to the nations around them. They were supposed to demonstrate the love of God to their neighbors without being corrupted by their neighbors. But under the Pharisees, they justified hating the very people they were supposed to be ministering to. And that's, it's precisely this teaching, this pattern of sin and death that tells us to hate those who are different, that causes Christians to fail at being the light of the world that Jesus has called us to be in the Sermon on the Mount. Yes, the correction is aimed at Christians. Sure, the Jews taught it. Jesus is speaking to kingdom people who are following after Him looking for truth. He says, you've heard them say, but I say... Love your neighbor. Jesus is giving the foundational message, message for his kingdom for people that are following him. As I mentioned before, that Dead Sea Scroll, the manual for discipline, found there at Qumran. It was most likely a library, all the Dead Sea Scrolls. It was mostly, most likely a library of a group of people called the Essenes. And they lived with a very strict adherence to the Mosaic Law. But they refused to associate with anyone who wasn't part of their group. Even like less legalistic Jews. Like, no, don't even want to talk to them. In their hatred for outsiders, they were content to watch the world go to hell from a comfortable distance. Listen, it's one thing to move away for legitimate opportunity or for actual circumstantial hardship, like reasons of safety and not starving to death. I get it, right? Circumstances, we, we, can, we can move for that. But it pains me to watch Christians move away from the people that God's called them to reach because those people don't vote how we vote or think how we think. Of course they don't. They're lost. They vote and think and act like lost people because they're lost people. And, and, and like he's called us to be light in the darkness among them. In the wilderness they're wandering in, groping out, trying to find who the Lord is. And he's near. And we're supposed to reflect that light. Yet in convenience, we go, you know what, I don't really like this. I, I want to go live in a little commune of people who just think what I think and like what I like, and, and, and their food doesn't smell weird, and they don't listen to weird music. So I'm going to just, you know what, they can all go to hell, and I'm going to go live in my bubble and wall myself off and keep myself from the people that Jesus died to save and called me to reach. Is there a bird in here or something? All right, everybody calm down. All right, if it flies in your mouth, it's just protein. It's no big deal. All right, we're focused. Ready? All right.
we're, we're called to reflect the light of the gospel into a world of darkness and sin. Amen? And so Jesus raises the bar high above this superficial righteousness of the Essenes and the Pharisees that calls hating our enemies good. And he does so with a transforming initiative that moves us out of that pattern that leads to nothing but a more polarized and hate-filled world. He says, you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. So Jesus, I love this, Jesus just assumes you're going to have enemies. He doesn't go, well, you might have enemies. No, no. Love the enemies you're going to have. You're going to have them. Then anybody going through life who doesn't have any enemies is probably compromising on truth. You're, you're going to have people that oppose you to one degree or another. He just assumes other people will hate and abuse and persecute other people. Love your friends? Sure, no problem. But then Jesus says, we're to love those who go out of their way to make our lives painful and difficult. Now, just so I don't feel alone this morning, how many find that to be a difficult command? Love the people who hate you. Look, I look at this, and I think of the people that go out of their way to cause trouble for me or to take advantage of me, and then Jesus tells me to love them, and I go, how? How can I do that? How do I love people that are evil? and antagonistic and do nothing but cause destruction and wound others. Well, it's, it's a really good thing that the word love in English doesn't mean what it means here in our passage. The word love in English is a very impotent word, isn't it? We use the same four letters to describe our appreciation for a good meal as we use to describe our affections for our family. I mean, who hasn't said, I love cheeseburgers, but that doesn't mean the same thing as I love my wife, I love my children, I love my church family. Yet it's the same four letters. Greek is much more precise. There's like eight different words in the Greek language that could be translated as love, four in the New Testament. There's a different word for romantic love. There's a different word for a familial bond. There's a different word for love that exists between true friends. And this word in our text is a different word entirely than any of those that are emotions. The word is agape. Some people mispronounce it agape. It's agape. In our text, it's in verb form. Jesus literally says, Thou shalt agape. Thou shalt love. Which is fitting because this word refers to actions independent of emotions. It's a benevolent love. It's a love that doesn't depend on affection or affinity. It's a love that's separate from emotion. Other kinds of love can exist at the same time. You can have romantic love or familial love and friendship love and agape. My, my wife is my romantic love. She's also my best friend. Yet there are times where it's simply a demonstration of agape love. I want to care for her and do things for her. And she, that's mutual. It's not mutual. She outdoes me in that every single day of the week. But 
agape is not as much an emotion that happens to us as much as it is an unconditional attitude of goodness demonstrated in appropriate actions of benevolence toward others. And so Jesus commands kingdom citizens to an unconditional attitude demonstrated in actions that seek that seeks the good of those who are our enemies. Understand that by commanding us to love our enemies, Jesus isn't commanding us to have warm affection for the person that slaps us across the face. He's not telling us to like the people that carjack us or rip us off or slander us. Nothing in this passage tells us how to feel. Nothing in this passage tells us we have to like anybody. Jesus isn't commanding our emotions here. He is commanding our attitude and our actions. He's commanding that we seek their good. Well, where does he get off doing that? The transforming initiative Jesus prescribes as righteousness that surpasses that of the Pharisees is a call to minister to those who oppose us. He doesn't say hug your enemies. He doesn't say give that person who hates you a heart-shaped box of chocolates on Valentine's Day. He uses three examples of this agopic love. He says, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and when somebody spitefully uses you or persecutes you, you pray for them. When was the last time you prayed? You prayed for the person who goes out of their way to rip you off, make your life difficult, cause problems in your life. That person who's your enemy. When was the last time? Uh, that convicts me. That question, I'd rather not answer it. Am I alone there? Just me? Now, in case you're thinking, well, I pray for them all the time. I pray that God would rain down fire on their heads. That's not, that's not what we're talking about. Remember, this is a call to love our enemies, and it's about our transformation. It's about our sanctification. It's about our becoming more like Jesus so that we can better glorify Jesus and how we live as His representatives in the world. And so where does Jesus get off? This is where He gets off. You want to see agape love on display? Romans 5, 8 through 11. But God demonstrates His own love, there's that word agape, toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. How does Jesus love His enemies? He dies for them to reconcile them to Himself. That's where He gets off commanding this of us. When Jesus went to the cross, He suffered on our behalf. We were yet sinners. We were enemies of God. Yet, He demonstrated love. Did Jesus suffer to bless those who cursed him? If you can't say amen, you've got to say ouch. Did Jesus suffer to bless those who cursed him? With vile insults, these people that mocked him and drove a crown of thorns into his head. He suffered for the good of those who hatefully scorned Him and craned their necks to violently spit in His face. And for those who spitefully persecuted Him, 
Jesus prayed from that cross with nail-pierced hands, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. My friends, whether by passive ignorance or deliberate antagonism, all of us, apart from Jesus, are numbered among those deserving of wrath. The Bible says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, yet, yet we who were enemies of God are saved from wrath through Him. God reconciled us who were once His enemies to demonstrate agape love. And it's that demonstration of love that also reconciles people who were, for centuries, people who hated each other. Jews and Gentiles. And He makes them one people. He makes them brothers and sisters, a new person in Christ. Ephesians 2, 14. I like the way this is written in the New Living Translation. For Christ Himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in His own body on the cross He broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. So can we get really practical for a minute? Because Jesus isn't calling us to die on a Roman cross for the sins of the world, okay? Everybody who's worried about that, He's not. You can't die for anybody's sin but your own. You have, you're guilty, right? I'm guilty. We can't die for other people's sin. So He's not calling us to that. But Jesus does say in Luke 9, 23, If anyone desires to come after Me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow Me. To follow Christ is to imitate His life of sacrificial, agape love toward His enemies. Now, there are people who we have an instinctive, natural affection or affinity for. There are people who, if we see them on the side of the road, broken down, we would naturally want to help, right? You see your friends? I want to help, of course. They're in bad shape. I'm there. Caring about them, doing good to them, that comes easy. And then there's people that we would rather not even slow down for. There are people who, perhaps because they've hurt us or slandered us, who, if we came across them and they were in bad shape, with no way out, our natural inclination would be to leave them there. Am I preaching to the choir? Are we all in this together? There's people that you... I, you're on your own, dude. Good luck. That you almost might have like, like, like a twisted joy in watching their misfortune. In Luke 10, Jesus is having a conversation with a lawyer who apparently had bought into this teaching of the Pharisees that he was righteous if he loved his friends and hated his enemies. And Jesus summarized the law. He says, look, the law is loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself. And the guy's like, okay, well, I want to justify myself. Who's my neighbor? Who, who's the person I have to love? Because I get to hate everybody else, right? And Jesus is like, okay, I'll tell you who your neighbor is by just describing what a neighbor is. And then Jesus gives the parable of the Good Samaritan. Remember, Jesus is talking to a Jew. He describes a Jew who's beaten, left on the side of the road for dead. Two Jewish guys pass by and do nothing. They can't be bothered to help him. But a Samaritan, a filthy, half-breed, Jew-Gentile mix who we can't stand, sees the Jewish guy, goes out of his way, demonstrates compassion, picks the guy up, takes him on his own animal, takes him to a place of safety when the Jewish guys are too busy and too, too pious to lift a finger to do anything anything for their own fellow Jewish guy, the Samaritan, the one who's hated by the Jews. It's the Samaritan who Jesus says is a good neighbor. Jesus prescribes for us 
a life of agape love. Liking someone, preferring their company, being best friends, that's, that's not in view here. These imperatives speak to the demonstration of loving actions independent of emotions even to those who hate us. Now, I do want to point out that nothing in this text would exclude us from seeking justice under the law. You can want justice to be done in a situation where somebody needs justice done without hating them. In fact, it may be loving to pursue that justice find that vile, guilty person who's doing horrible things. Remember, if they don't receive justice, they'll probably victimize somebody else who is also your neighbor that you're commanded to love. So justice isn't off the table. Justice is good. God is a just God. Pursuing justice is absolutely fine. I can love someone to the point of seeking justice is done when they need to go to jail. They, I, I can want them to go to jail. But I have no prerogative to hate them. I don't have that right. As we come back to our text, Jesus gives us two reasons for this call to love. He says in verse 45, Do this that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. Jesus calls us to look to the fields of those who might hate us. And when it rains on our field, he notices it rains on theirs too. And it's God who makes it rain. And when the sun comes out, it's sunny on their field, even though they hate us. And it's God that makes the sun, the sun shine. So God doesn't show partiality in His goodness, in His benevolence, in His agape love, based on whether or not somebody is His friend. He's kind to everyone. He causes the same sun to shine on the fields of the righteous and the wicked at the same time. God's love isn't limited. It's not reserved for preferred people. And when we love like God, we demonstrate that we are children of God. Love is supposed to be the defining characteristic of kingdom people. The second reason Jesus gives for this call to love is in verse 48. Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, perfect here does not mean sinless. It doesn't mean moral perfection. Though God in heaven is sinless and morally perfect, we're, we're not. This word is a very interesting Greek word. And it refers to something that's in its completed state. It's a word used to describe, like, ripeness or maturity. It's full grown. You see, it takes no spiritual maturity to demonstrate goodness to those who are good to us. That's natural. Even tax collectors do that. Even pagans who don't know the Lord are good to those who are good to them. But to demonstrate love to the wicked, to the undeserving, to those who hate us, that is a mark of mature faith and Christ-likeness. There is not a singular act that is more Christ-like than the demonstration of agape love to someone who despises you. Let me repeat that. There is not a singular act that is more Christ-like than the demonstration of agape love to someone who despises you. You see, to, to do this, it says more about us than it says about the people who oppose all the things we hold dear. And we bristle at this and they go, but they want to rob me and they want to ruin me and they want to run me out of town and all they do is take and consume. They don't deserve this kind of love. Isn't that the point? 
Jesus loved us before we loved him. He loved us when we hated him. And when we live this out, it demonstrates that God is renovating our hearts. And it proves to us and to others that we're growing into spiritual maturity in our minds and in our character. It's evidence that we're actively integrating godly values into our daily lives as the grace that we've been shown while we were at our worst is demonstrated to people who are still at their worst. Beyond that, this kind of love is the greatest among all spiritual gifts. It's really easy to, to, to talk about spiritual gifts and people get hung up on certain things and they, they really want certain flashy things. You know what's the greatest one? Love for people who are hard to love. I can prove it. Let's prove it together. Read this with me out loud. 1 Corinthians 14, 4 through 13. Ready? Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. Love does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part... And then I shall know just as I am also known. And now abide faith, hope, and love. These three. But the greatest of these is love. My friends, love that seeks good. Love that seeks the, the best, highest good. Love that seeks the salvation of those who hate us is evidence of mature faith. It is natural to love those who love us. It's a work of the Holy Spirit, a miracle that God works in us when we come to love our enemies. And so we'll close this section with two points of application. Commit to love without partiality. I, I'm, I'm saying like right here, right now, like now, now, you and God do business. Commit to love without partiality. You make that covenant agreement right now that says, God, I'm going to love people that you died for even though they hate me and even though I might hate them back. Help me, grow me, work in me, transform me. Help me love them the way you love them. You died for them. Surely I could go out of my way for them. C.S. Lewis put it this way in Mere Christianity. The rule for all of us is perfectly simple. Do not waste your time bothering whether you love your neighbor. Act as if you did. And soon, as we do this, we find one of the greatest secrets. When you're behaving as if you love someone, you will presently come to love him. If you injure someone you dislike, you will find yourself disliking him more. If you do him a good turn, you will find yourself disliking him less. The difference between a Christian and a worldly man is not that the worldly man has only affections or likings and the Christian has only charity. The worldly man treats certain people kindly because he likes them. The Christian, trying to treat everyone kindly, finds himself liking more and more people as he goes on, including people he could not have imagined himself liking at the beginning. Isn't that the gospel? We're enemies of God, yet He transforms us into beloved children 
who are renewed in their hearts and in their minds and in their relationship with Him. And our behavior, our desires, everything about us changes. When we demonstrate love without partiality, we become ministers of reconciliation. And in renewed relationships, we have greater opportunity to share the gospel. And this is why we must commit all things to Christ. Second point of application. Commit to Christ in all things. Winning a political argument, securing some position or status in the world, preserving something that's temporary at best, within certain parameters, that's all well and good. Those things have their place. But all of those things should be secondary at best in the life of a Christ follower. We are here to glorify God and make disciples. Why are we here? We exist to see that God is worshipped by people who don't worship Him. We exist, we're here to see God worshipped in places where He's not being worshipped. We're here to serve Him with all we are, with all we have, with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the priority. Everything else we do is a branch growing out from that tree. But when we lose focus and we treat other things as more important, we fight the wrong war. And instead of entering warfare against sin and death, we war against the people, sinners as they may be, we war against the people that we're commanded to love. But when we keep Christ as the, priorities of our, as the priority of our lives, let me start over. When we keep Christ as the priority of our lives, we can love even those who hate us in the way that Christ loves us and them. With that, let's close in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for loving us when we were at our very worst. While we were enemies of God, yet sinners. Whether by pure amb amb ambivalence or active hostility toward you, God, we made ourselves your enemies. We set ourselves against you. And in return, you loved us. And you sent your Son to die for us so that we could be redeemed so that we could be forgiven and washed and adopted as your sons and daughters. Lord, perhaps one would die for his friends. But it's unheard of to die for his enemies. That's exactly what you've done. It's by that sacrifice that we have life. But our lives are not our own. We were bought at a price. We're yours. You've called us to live as your people and to imitate how you love. God, we need your help. So God, I, I pray that you would help us to love like you. That by your Spirit working in us, that the defining gift and character trait of this body of believers would be that agape love that we see in Jesus Christ. Amen.